Good evening. It's just a delight to be with you tonight to bring the word uh, for our time of worship and then to lead us in the Lord's table together to remember Christ Jesus' magnificent cross work on behalf of his people. And tonight is Good Friday of Passion Week, and I have one, I have one purpose for our time together tonight, just one purpose. I want us to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want us to reflect on the beauty and majesty and glory of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to behold the beauty of the one who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we... We desperately need you to superintend over this time. Uh, Preaching of the word is a supernatural event. It's your word. Nothing will transpire here tonight unless the dear spirit, the Holy Spirit, takes the word and penetrates our hearts and lives with the truth and uses it to not only save those who have walked in who know you not, but to sanctify and grow up the saints. And that happens, I truly believe, as we behold the beauty of Christ more and more. So please help us to do that tonight. Uh, Be with us, encourage our hearts, and may you be honored and glorified, Father, through the exaltation of your Son. In the power of the Spirit, we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to consider briefly five main points to focus our attention on the Lamb. First, we want to consider the promise of the Lamb, just briefly in the Old Testament. Second, we want to consider the glory and wonder and beauty of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Third, we will consider the Lamb's path of loving obedience that he walked throughout his life, climaxed by his greatest act of loving obedience, death on a cross. Fourth, we're going to consider the propitiatory sacrifice of the Lamb at the cross to take away the sins of the world. The Lamb was punished as a substitutionary sacrifice, appeasing the wrath of God, all the fullness of God's wrath against mankind's sin. And finally, we'll consider at the end uh, the purchased blessings of the Lamb's sacrifice for the good of God's people and the glory of His name. So, before looking at John the Baptist's testimony. Let's begin by considering the Old Testament promise of the Lamb. Promise of the Lamb. We know the need. Adam and Eve's sin in the garden severed their perfect, sinless relationship with God and plunged the entire human race into darkness and death. The result... For every person born into this world is that they are born spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Because of this, God had to take the initiative to recover or redeem men back into a relationship with himself. And the first promise of this redemptive purpose, right in Genesis 3.15, where we read, And I will put enmity between you and the woman Between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. It's at the cross. It's at the cross that the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, crushes the head of the serpent, Satan. And throughout the Old Testament, God continues to show himself to be a redeeming God as scriptures progress to the point of the ultimate divine redemption, the cross of Jesus. For example, in Genesis 
22, uh, when Isaac speaks to his father Abraham in verses 7 and 8, uh, as they're going to sacrifice him, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? For the burnt offering, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. The the reality pictured of a substitutionary sacrifice so that Isaac could be spared. The Passover lamb. A couple months ago, Ken preached on this. The Passover and what happened there to deliver the firstborn uh, uh, sons of Israel. In Exodus 12, 21, we read, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay, slaughter the Passover lamb. And and we're going to celebrate the Lord's table And Jesus did in Mark 14, 12, on the first day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare to eat the Passover knowing who he is as the Passover lamb? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump just as you are in fact unleavened for Christ our Passover lamb also has been sacrificed. I mean, the entire Old Testament sacrificial system with its offerings, uh, like the sin offering or the Day of Atonement, uh, highlighting the need for blood atonement over and over. Leviticus 17.11, God says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Blood had to be shed to forgive sins. And Isaiah 53, I hope you were here last Sunday when Ken preached a marvelous message from that text about the suffering servant Messiah and what it meant for us. Just a couple verses to remind us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. But the Lord God, the Lord God, the Father, was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, hear it, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. So we have the promise of the righteous one, God's suffering servant Messiah, who would come and willingly be slaughtered like a lamb to justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. So now let me read our verse in the context of John the Baptist's testimony in the Gospel of John as we reflect on the beauty of God's beloved son, the person of God's beloved Son. We want to behold Him, this beautiful Lamb sent by the Father into the world. So we read in John chapter 1. This is John's testimony. The next day, after interacting with the Pharisees and Sadducees, their their representatives, who are you, John? I'm not the Christ, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the prophet. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him. The baptism has already taken place, as we'll see, of Jesus. Jesus coming to him, and John just explodes. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. 
I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. John testifies that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, no doubt reflecting upon the passage we just read in Isaiah chapter 53. John testifies that, that this is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. John testifies that I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and remaining upon him, uh, that, that this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I, I'm just with water, but he, he can baptize with the Holy Spirit, change lives. And John testifies, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So here's the forerunner to the Messiah. He confirms that Jesus is the one God promised to send into the world. He is both the Lamb of God as well as the Messianic King, the Son of God. He is both the suffering servant, sin bearer of Isaiah 53, and he is the fulfillment of Davidic covenant promise, the lion from the tribe of Judah. And this is so important because it is only the lion, the king, who can be the lamb. It's only the king who redeems his citizens into kingdom citizenship for all eternity. He's our king and our lamb. And these two truths about him are confirmed not only in the Old Testament, but in the birth announcements of Matthew and Luke. We see them. These truths about the person of Jesus. You remember when Joseph wanted to dismiss Mary because she was with child and do it compassionately? Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, son of David's important, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The Lamb. In Luke 1, we read, as Gabriel comes to Mary, he tells her, Behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus again. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. You see, he's the lamb and the lion for all eternity. And, and, and think about the wonder of John's statement in verse 30. After me, let's just think together. After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I. For he existed before me. How can a man, this Jesus, who is coming toward John, who was born after him, have a higher rank than him because he existed before him? And this is where John the Apostle, John the Apostle, in the prologue to this glorious gospel in which we have John the Baptist's testimony, this glorious makes, makes a powerful, clear statement about how this can be true. You know this text. Jesus is a man, but he's more than a man, isn't he? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, 
Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. That, that statement by, is put into the prologue of John where we have the eternal word being spoken about. For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And I love this. No one has seen God at any time, have they? Moses, you can see my back. Nobody can see the fullness of who I am and live. Not even the holy angels can, can take that in and continue to exist because of who he is. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him to us. Folks, this is the glory and wonderful reality of the gospel. In Revelation 13, verse 8, as John is explaining certain things about the time of the tribulation, he says this, and all those who live on the earth will worship him, this beast, whose names are not written in the book of life. And he says this, of the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. The Lord Jesus the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. This was God's eternal plan and purpose. In eternity past, God the Son, the second person of the eternal Godhead, sweetly submitted to accomplish the will of the Father, who is the supreme, supreme in his position with authority among the persons of the Godhead, and the one who is the supreme designer and planner of creation and all the resulting purpose he's bringing about to bring glory to his name. Yes. And Jesus, the lamb slain before time. Before time. You, you see this sweet submission of God the Son to God the Father in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And this is before time. And remember, Ken was speaking last week. He said, it, it pleased the Father to crush him, but it pleased the Son to be crushed, to bring glory to God. And that's what everything is all about in this plan and purpose as God is moving all things to exalt Christ to the glory of his name for all eternity. Yes. Slain before the foundation in eternity past, he sweetly submitted, and you see this in Philippians 2. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Not the incarnate Christ Jesus, because listen to what he says, who although he, Christ Jesus, existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. A thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. How did he empty him? By taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, human being, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he sweetly humbled himself to the will of the Father by becoming obedient to the point of death. That's the kind of obedience he exercised. Here's the depth of it even death on a cross. In Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, therefore when he comes into the world, the son, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God to do your will, O God, my Father. In John 6, 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me to bring glory to his name. So the man who was walking toward John was and is the fullness of deity in bodily form. He was and is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation, the one through whom and for whom all things have been created. The person sent by the Father into history to be the Lamb of God is the, is the eternal union of the full divine nature of God the Son with the full human nature of the Son of David. And, and, and dear people, Without the miraculous union of the two natures in the one person of Christ Jesus, there can be no lamb. No redemption for sinful men. God the Son cannot take sin on himself and die. But the human being can do it. It has to be done this way. This union was true at the moment of Jesus' conception. As the angel Gabriel told Mary, the Holy Spirit, as we read before in Matthew, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. But the crowds and John and the disciples on that day, saw only a man walking toward John. On that day. And this leads us to our third point tonight. I think this is really important. I, 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 sometimes we don't talk about this. We, we get right to the cross. But I, I want to see you how the Lamb got to the cross. The Lamb's path to the cross. And, and this is an amazing thing to consider, really. As we read in Philippians, God the Son emptied himself, taking the fullness of this human nature to himself so that he could die on a cross and rise again. God the Son can't do that. Son of David can do that. Die and rise. This is magnificent. How this works itself out. Under the sovereign hand of the Father, Jesus, listen, lived his first Advent life as the Lamb, fundamentally as a human being, without drawing on the divine attributes which he possessed in full. From the moment of conception, he's the fullness of deity in bodily form, but he voluntarily lived a human life a human, as a human being filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish the cross work of the Lamb out of love for His Father and love for His people. And this is so important for us because as a result of the way He lived this life of the Lamb, He can be our example. Our example of how it is and looks like to... To, to walk with God in a love relationship, we'll see that. We'll see that. Everything he had, we have. But he was without sin. Let's think about this dear... Think, think of the condescension of God the Son to do this, to come to earth, to live this way. To be the Lamb of God. We want to behold the Lamb of God. And, and so this is the way he got to the cross. This is his path. Two examples of this are his growth in wisdom and his learning obedience. Here he is, this human being. We read in Luke 2, verse 40, the child, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2.52, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. These texts indicate that Jesus grew not only physically in stature, but also in wisdom. This is the fullness of deity in bodily form. How could this? This is why we have to get our arms around this. How he voluntarily limited the expression of his divine attributes to be this lamb. This reflects growth as a human being. This wisdom must be that associated with Jesus' human nature 
as the son of David because the divine nature cannot grow in wisdom. Jesus grew from infancy. He was a conceived, born as a baby into adulthood as a human being. And as a result, he grew in both mind and body just like every other human being. Dr. Ware comments, as a boy, Jesus learned, no doubt, through the instruction of his parents, from the teaching of the rabbis in his hometown of Nazareth, and through his own diligent reading of God's Word. (laughs) It was by these means that he grew and increased in wisdom. For Jesus to grow in wisdom, as Luke stresses, it surely indicates Growth that takes place in his human nature. It's not like the divine nature just did a ram dump of everything he needed to know into his brain. The human mind and the divine mind are associated with the divine nature and the human nature, and he's limited his expression to be the lamb. Think about this. Think about this. And it's important to recall that the Father gave to Jesus the Son, His beloved Son, the Spirit without measure. You can see that in John 3.34. He was the Spirit-anointed Messiah as reflected in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. You can go read that. The Spirit upon Him. Jesus grew in His understanding as He studied the Word of God, filled with the Spirit, the inspired author of the Word. And without possessing a sin nature to hinder his understanding of the truth, the favor of God was upon him as the Spirit of God granted him supernatural wisdom, understanding, and articulation of those truths when he would interact. Speaking forth what the Word of God had declared in the power of the Spirit The Spirit illumined the Word of God to Jesus' mind and cultivated that Word in his heart as Jesus read, studied, heard, and was taught that precious inspired Word. Isn't this amazing? If that's how he grew in wisdom, what what should we be doing with this book? We We should be in it to know and understand, and and we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And because we still have a sin nature, we, we wrestle through interpretations. He didn't have to do that. He knew exactly what it meant when he read it. So imagine the day when Jesus was reading through and meditating upon the prophet Isaiah when he came to chapter 53. The Spirit must have opened his mind and heart to understand from this text that he was, in fact, the suffering servant of whom Isaiah wrote. He would be the one who would bear the sins of many. He would be the one crushed by his Father. The one through whose work the Father would be able to justify the many. Can you imagine as he gets that? So, Jesus is our great example, isn't he? Of a man growing in wisdom through a fervent, joyful study of the Scriptures with the illuminating presence of the Holy Spirit. For Jesus, it was not academic, I guarantee you that. It was about knowing his Father and being about his Father's business. May we reflect his heart when we open this book. I hope you open it even and read it, and think, and interact, and sharpen iron with others. We we need each other in this pursuit of truth. But we need to pursue truth, because you see Christ on the pages of this book. Second, he he learned obedience. Isn't that amazing? Hebrews 5.8, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered For Christ Jesus' obedience to the Father did not begin at the Incarnation. As we've seen from eternity past, there was this sweet, submissive spirit of the second person of the Godhead to the supreme person, God the Father. 
But this text states he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Again, where Dr. Ware observes, this is very interesting. The son's obedience in eternity past was true obedience. But it was not an obedience forged in the fires of suffering. Jesus' obedience as a man was rendered often within the context of opposition and affliction and conflict, wasn't it? With the result that his obedience was the cause of much further suffering, more opposition, more conflict. And was putting himself in a place of increased suffering as a human being. Under the Father's hand, as this unfolded, Jesus was prepared throughout a lifetime of loving obedience, facing more difficult trials as he matured into manhood, especially during his three years of ministry, public ministry. His love for and trust in his Father grew, grew. It wasn't static, it grew. It's human nature. As he matured, saturated with the Scriptures and filled with the Spirit, the Father prepared his beloved Son as he learned to obey in increasingly difficult circumstances accompanied by increasingly difficult opposition until he faced the greatest divine demand and accomplished the greatest act of loving obedience, the cross. Remember John 14, 31? Getting ready to leave the, the upper room. But so that the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. Prepared by the Father. And I'll tell you, folks, this divine preparation is seen in his agonizing wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane. When after the third time, third time stating, my father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Remember, love for the father. And after that third time, you can read in the text, it says he returns to the sleeping disciples and declares with authority, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. So the result, I see the result of his agonizing wrestling in the garden as the God, God the Father prepared him to do battle against the enemy is the victorious declaration in Hebrews for the joy now set before him he endured the cross. For the joy now. It's settled. It's settled. The climax of his suffering was also the climax of his life of faithful, loving obedience to the Father, qualifying him to be our great high priest, coming to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Amen? He defeated the enemy and his lies with unwavering faith and trust in his Father's will for him set forth in the unbreakable certainty of his Father's promises to him to exalt him through the resurrection from the dead, and seat him at his right hand, as it says in Psalm 110, the joy set before him. And even on the cross, <clears throat> dear people, when he cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That, if you go read the whole Psalm 22. He knows the whole Psalm. At the end of that Psalm is the victory of the king. And the coming of the kingdom. He's fulfilling promise, prophecy, as he makes that cry. But he defeated the enemy, clinging to the promises of God his Father. 
filled with the Holy Spirit, saturated with the Word of God. What do you have to fight? Same thing. Same thing. Well, after that tremendous struggle in the garden, the victory of that, we have the propitiatory sacrifice of the Lamb. Now we have the cross. Oh, dear people, I'm going to read you from Matthew about this. This is the father dealing with his son as the sin bearer. The sin bearer, venting the fullness of his wrath upon him as a propitiatory sacrifice to turn that way, that wrath away from anyone who would put their faith in him to be delivered from this awful wrath of God. You remember how it begins, and you can put all the Gospels together. So many good things are said and done, but in Matthew we read, and in John we read that the same kinds of things. Then the soldiers of the government took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman court cohort around him. They hate the Jews. The Romans hate the Jews. That's why Cornelius is such a miracle. God saved him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting together a crown of thorns, do you see those? Ah, Can you imagine having that plunged down on your head? They put it on his head, not gently either, and a reed in his hand. They knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. This is the Messiah, the one to whom all authority in heaven and earth will be given, the one who could have called 12 legions of angels to stop this. Doesn't say a word. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. We just read that as a sentence. Well, how, what a horrible way to die, just physically. Horrible. Roman citizens wouldn't even pronounce that term. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. After tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. You see, that was, supposed, that was there to just, that's a mercy, you know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll numb the pain. No! I want the fullness of it to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots, like it said in the Old Testament. Sitting down, they began to keep watch over him. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Indeed, he is. And all the other nations as well, At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by, this is amazing. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, the king, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. It's in that context, he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. 
That's true of every one of us. We're so blind and dead in sin, we're just insane not embracing this Savior. We mock, we ridicule, we live our lives as if there's no eternity coming. We need Him so desperately. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, if God delights in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. You remember in another gospel, one of them was saved by the grace of God. As he watched Jesus die, he's putting it together. Maybe from Isaiah 53, who knows how God opened his eyes, but he believed by the grace of God. Wow. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land. This is a supernatural darkness. Until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We talked about that. He knows the end of the story. And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man's calling for Elijah. There was a tradition, Elijah saving. Immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him to drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Oh, praise God, he would not be saved. He would not be delivered. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Notice, he yielded up his spirit. They didn't take it from him. He yielded it up. He's in control. God's Father's in control. And behold, as we've talked already tonight, the the veil in the temple preventing access to God, the Holy of Holies, was torn into from top to bottom. Oh, what a miracle. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, as a witness to his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now get this. The centurion, now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over him when they saw the earthquake. And the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. This was not just a normal human criminal. <laughs> Go. Isaiah 53. But, it, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Putting him and he did render himself as a guilt offering, didn't he? He's the righteous one, my servant, who justifies the many bearing their iniquities. Let me ask you tonight, is he your lamb tonight? <clears throat> Are you trusting in him as your substitute sacrifice? to take the fullness of the wrath of God against you in your place. There's no other way, people, to be delivered from God's eternal judgment but, but through personally, personally trusting in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. With, without this, there's nothing coming but the lake of fire. We're talking about God's unadulterated, fierce wrath for all eternity against you and your sins against him. What a, I can't imagine that. In Revelation it says they'll be tormented in the presence of the Lamb and his holy angels forever. They're going to know he's the one judging them and they're going to hate him more and they're going to get righteous judgment heaped upon them. It's not static. For all eternity, more and more judgment. No possibility of redemption. Now's the time for redemption. If you don't know him, come to him. He won't turn you away. 
He will embrace you and save you if He is your Lamb tonight. Come to Jesus, please. There's no other way to escape from God's awful, righteous justice and wrath. Finally, last few minutes. The purchased blessings of the Lamb sacrament. I mean, we could go on and on. But you remember at the Last Supper, Jesus declared, and we're going we're gonna to read it in a little bit. This is the new covenant in my blood. Wow! All the new covenant salvation benefits, blessings we receive were purchased by His blood. Your, your justification, your transformation into the very image of Jesus, your glorification one day purchased by His blood, the crushing of sin's power and presence and penalty accomplished by His blood so that you can be with Him forever. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that what? We might become the righteousness of God in Him he died so that you can be justified, declared righteous before God. You, are, you put your faith in this Lamb and you're cleansed by His blood and clothed in His righteousness. That's your position. And then you're going to be changed into that very wonderful position as you grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, beholding the glory of God in His face and one day perfectly reflect Him in resurrected glory. Here's 1 Peter 1.18. I like this. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Here's the purpose. So that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Yes, he died so that you could be justified and not be hurt by the second death, the lake of fire. But the great benefit of his death and resurrection for you, is t- he, he, t- he takes care of everything necessary for you to be brought to God the Father in an eternal, loving relationship to become an adopted son or daughter. This is not just about hell insurance. That's the negative. The positive so outweighs that. You don't want to just preach to people, you need this to, so you don't go to hell. You need this so you can know the living God and be loved by Him, and love Him. The Father says in Revelation 21.7, He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be His God, and He will be my Son. He will be my Son. Jesus died and rose again for you so that you can be changed into His very image as you behold the glory of God in His face. And one day, to perfectly reflect Him in resurrected glory, a resurrected glorified body, worshiping Him as the firstborn among many brethren, and singing with all the saints and the heavenly hosts, worthy as the Lamb that was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing And to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Till people, the Lamb slain before time, we see him in time, and for all eternity he will be the Lamb and worshiped as the Lamb. The Lion who is the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time tonight. Beholding the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Would you please drive these truths home to our hearts? Help us to to meditate, reflect, think, and wonder at the Lord Jesus and how he lived his life to be the Lamb, not only without drawing on the divine attributes as he was crushed, but giving us an example in our lives of how to live our lives filled with the Spirit, saturated with the Word of God, 
in a, in a love relationship with you, a wholehearted love relationship with you, yet without sin. So Lord, we pray that we'd be like Jesus. We pray tonight as we partake that we would reflect upon the beauty of the Lamb. It's so deep and rich and wonderful that we can't exhaust it. Help us here to be about it. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.